to welcome Gustavo Esteva and thank all of you for coming to this event tonight. Um, this event um, can happen, thank you to the Forum for Free Speech, the Dean's Office, Serendipity Fund, the Spanish section of Modern Languages, and Latin American Studies. Um, I'm very happy to be able to present Gustavo Esteva tonight. I had the pleasure of studying with him a year ago um, and it's definitely a great pleasure to have him here at Swarthmore tonight. Um, in the words of David C. Corton, Gustavo Esteva is an independent writer, a grassroots activist, and a deprofessionalized intellectual. He has been a key figure in founding several Mexican, Latin American, and international NGOs and networks. But not an economist by training, he has received Mexico's National Prize of Political Economy, and though not a sociologist, he was president of the Fifth World Rural um, Sociology Congress. He has also served as president of the Mexican Society of Planning, vice president of the Inter-American Society of Planning, and served as board member and interim chairman of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. In his early career, he held senior positions in both private business and government, and was destined for a distinguished career between Mex um, within Mexico's establishment. He decided, however, that solutions to people's problems could come only from the people themselves, and has since dedicated himself to their service. He is a well-known writer with 3,000 books and hundreds of essays and articles published around the world in numerous languages. Through regular columns in leading Mexican newspapers, he takes special interest in expanding public awareness about the reality and hopes of the so-called poor with whom he is associated. He was invited by the Zapatistas to be their advisor in 1996, and since then he has been very active in what today is called Zapatismo, involving himself with the current struggle of indigenous peoples in Mexico. He lives in a small Zapotec village in the south of Mexico. Please join me in giving Gustavo Esteva a warm welcome. Thanks a lot, Mahandra, for you and for all the, your friends that uh, made possible to come here. And thanks you all for being present this afternoon. <coughs> October 28 is the um, national holiday in Greece. As in most countries, you have uh, that day of the national holiday. You have a big parade in which the students and other people are marching when they are before the authorities, they salute the authorities and they continue uh, the parade. This year, last October, something unusual happened. They were marching, the students were marching, they have the big parade. When they were before the authorities, instead of turning their face to the authorities, they turned their face to the other side, to the people. They were saluting the people not the authorities. That day, one friend of mine, Katerina, wrote to me about her impressions of that day. Let me read what she wrote. That day from Athens. How you organize a revolution? How you stop the destructive force of the powers that be? I don't know. But today in Greece, we are experiencing civil disobedience everywhere. We live within their system. We live among them. But we think, we act, we breathe, as if we were beyond their closed world. We break every day the discipline they are trying to impose on us. We reject the rules. We live among them, <coughs> but without them. They don't listen. We don't want to see them. They are still in power. They are taking the decisions against us and using violence, but we are no longer recognizing them. We are turning our face to another side, to ourselves. That is what she wrote. And I bring this because I think this is happening everywhere. There is an increasing distance between the powers that be and the people, and more and more people are turning their face to themselves. We are all living, living in a radical situation everywhere. A radical situation is a kind of collective awakening when two factors are combined. First, a very difficult situation, a difficult situation for everyone. 
when uh, jobs, assets, and expectations are lost, and solid safeties that were the stuff cementing social life melt into thin air. And then, second, you have this general situation, problematic situation. And then the second point is when there is an increasing evidence that conventional remedies aggravate the condition instead of solving it. When these two factors combine, there is a turning point, a rupture. People rip the um, concealing veils of the dominant mentality. In a radical situation, there is effervescence, precipitation. People learn more about society in a week than in years of social studies. People unknown to each other and with very different political ideas or projects reach quickly solid consensus. All this happens suddenly, from one day to the next. But the collective awakening that defines a radical situation requires time to ripen, its own time, its own calendar, calendar, its own geography. In a radical situation, autonomous liberating initiatives tend to predominate over demagoguery and fatigue. Imaginations repressed for a long time wake up, and what is considered normal now seems like sleepwalking. The emperor's nakedness becomes suddenly evident. A radical situation is a sprig of novelties. It produced some solid constructions that can be destroyed but not corrupted. It also produces fascinated creations which often endure. But the tack of the protest, which is evidence of the awakening and becomes contagious, cannot be predicted. Even in those cases, like today, in which to continue sleeping becomes almost impossible and the awakening begins to take the shape of a rebellion. Yes, we need to understand the roots of the current situation, but understanding is not enough. This is a call to our senses. We need to feel it and to have the guts to digest it. How to formulate our current challenges in the pertinent way one of the main difficult questions is that we are trying to cultivate a new worldview that cannot be a worldview, when we need to give voice to a broad range of views from many parts of the world, from many philosophical and spiritual traditions. Jefferson once said, when the governments are afraid of people, we have freedom. When the people are afraid of government, we have tyranny. People are mobilized everywhere. Profuse, confuse, and diffuse discontent becomes organized in different ways. The battalions of discontents, the main outcome of neoliberalism, are becoming a real force and a threat for the political classes, for the governments, for capital because they become refuse nicks, people rejecting the system. As a consequence, the governments are afraid of people. We those have both, governments in panic and people intimidated. For us, from outside, what is happening in the US is a real surprise. Perhaps for the first time in 200 years, Millions of people are rejecting the very political system invented here, the system universally presented as a model, the model of modern democracy. Even more, a recent poll of the Pew Research Center, you, you know this is a very conservative center, some people can call it uh, reactionary, but they are very serious, they, they, they do a very solid job. And uh, they have a recent poll. And they asked millions of people in America, people uh, less than 30 years old, their opinion about capitalism and socialism. 49% of the Ameri young Americans preferred socialism to capitalism. 
and this is happening 40 year, after 40 years of the Cold War when it was not only the Soviet Union, the identified enemy, but sociali socialism itself. And then we may end in the paradoxical situation in which the Americans will become uh, socialists when we need to bury socialism. This, that is to acknowledge that this is a historical phenomenon. It had a beginning and should have an end. And we are at the beginning of the end of the time of socialism. What we see today everywhere is that something fundamental has been unmasked. And the grievances that an increasing number of people have been uttering in private for years are suddenly made public. All governments perceive the situation as a threat. It is, of course, a threat. They just want to gain control, to stop the, rise, the uprising, or to prevent the extension of what they see as a disease. They use different pretexts in different countries to widen the control of the population. Uh, terrorism in, in some places, drug trafficking in others, everywhere they attempt to implement an effective control. London, that very civilized city, that beautiful city, where if you go as a tourist and you go around in the city, and you are just out south seeing, sightseeing in the city, your face will appear 300 times every day in a video camera. Uh, they are trying to control every movement of everyone in every place. Uh, some people think that what happened a few years ago with the swine flu was an experiment in social control. But they are failing. We may have violent confrontations like in Greece these days. Or we may have the non-violent articulation at the grassroots to unclose the unclosed. All these things force us to revisit democracy. For that purpose, we need to start with the question of power. Power is usually perceived as a thing that some people have and some others don't. Some others don't. People upstairs, the powerful, with economic or political power, they have this thing, power, this thing the power. And that is why you are talking about empowerment then meaning we are or we will organize the redistribution of this thing, the power to organize the redistribution among all the people. Um, we cannot treat power that way. It is not a thing. It's not something that you can organize the distribution. Power is always a relation and what you can do all the time is to change that specific relation. It is not a thing. The second the most important point about power is that for 200 years, all political theories have been constructed around the premise formulated by Hegel in 1820. The basic premise, the principle is people cannot govern themselves. Then because people cannot govern themselves, then someone needs to govern them. Then you can have a dispute through elections, what kind of democratic elections, uh, you can seize power, you can have a guerrilla, you can have a revolution, but always under the premise that people cannot govern themselves. And then you need to uh, create a system for some people to govern them. What we need to discuss today, perhaps the most important point in political uh, discussion today, is that uh, we need to compare this principle, that is the dominant principle in all political theories, with an alternative principle that is people can govern themselves. And what we need to do is to create the appropriate political bodies for people to govern themselves. This is uh, one of the most important questions today. Uh, today in the world, you have some people that try to still improve formal representative democracy. Now that for everyone it's evident that the representatives are representing only the one percent. The people are discussing how we can improve our procedures, our electoral procedures or whatever, to have a good representation of the 99 percent. I must tell you that uh, this is, in a certain way, peculiar uh, to have that discussion um, in other countries. Because for people like uh, the Mexicans and many other countries, we knew all the time that they were not representing us. We have a very good electoral system. 
of what happened in Ohio and Florida could not happen in Mexico today. We have formally a perfect system for the election. But we know that they don't represent us. They have never represented us. Uh, that uh, it means that we don't have the most important democratic institution. That institution is the belief of the majority of the people that these people upstairs represent their interests, represent them, represent the 99%. Some people say that's not enough. We need to improve the elections. We need to improve formal democracy. But we need something more. We need what is described today as participatory democracy more involvement of the citizens in the decisions through uh, referendum, plebiscite, recall, these kind of things, that more and more people will participate in the uh, operations of the government. In some cases, uh, like in Switzerland, they are now, the citizens are now really bored with this participatory democracy because they need to vote every uh, other week. Uh, they vote for the increase in the, rise of, in the price of the bread or they, they, they vote for almost everything. That is participatory democracy. They are voting for more and more things, participating in the decisions of the society. Yes, more and more people are involved in that kind of uh, discussions, but perhaps the most important uh, area of struggle today in the world is uh, what is described as radical democracy. Not formal democracy, not representative democracy, not participatory democracy, radical democracy. And radical democracy means that instead of a system of representation, uh, people attempt to reorganize the society from the bottom up to create a different kind of political bodies. They see formal democracy as a good umbrella for the transition. They see participatory democracy as a good exercise for radical democracy. But this is not what they are trying to do. They are trying to really organize a different kind of society. We are living, in fact, in revolutionary times. If you want uh, to keep in your backpack one thing, one single thing of our conversation tonight, of this hour and a half, please try to keep the hypothesis that there is an ongoing insurrection. Try to see if this insurrection is also here in your own place or it is only in my mind. What is revolution today? The very idea of revolution, the idea which started with Pope, with Pope Gregory VII in the 12th century uh, began the, realized the attempt the first attempt for a total reform of the world. That idea of revolution that dominated all the revolutions in the last 200 years is over. It has become impossible. The current revolution cannot take that shape. We cannot discuss. There are many elements. There are a lot of literature demonstrating how that kind of revolution is over, how and why. We are also at the end of the so-called the Leninist paradigm. Uh, perhaps you know, you have heard of that uh, small pamphlet written by Lenin in 1905, uh, what, is to do, what uh, we should do. And uh, this paradigm lasted for 100 years, in the left and in the right. That paradigm implies basically these principles. First, people, the people, the ordinary men and women, the masses, they don't know what to do. And they can't do what is needed by themselves. And then if people cannot do that, you need a small group of people, the revolutionaries, that uh, will have first the ideology, a sense of purpose, a proposal. Then you create a pertinent organization. Then you seize power. And then once in power, you implement the revolution. And then you can apply this Leninist paradigm to Stalin or Mao or Fidel Castro, but also to President Reagan or to Mrs. Thatcher. It is exactly the same principle. And you can even explore that and discover that that was, that was in the Federalist Papers. There was that discussion between Hamilton and Madison, and they were discussing, should we have for the American Union, should we have a democracy or should we have a republic? What is the difference? With a democracy, it's the power in the hands of the people. 
and the people take decisions, and the people handle all the affairs. What is a republic? Oh, in the republic, there is a group of people that control the power, control all the elements of power. And then the people believe that they are in power. The people still vote. The people feel that they are in democracy. But there are some people controlling the whole business. And there was a big discussion. And the discussion was, oh, we cannot put the power in the hands of the people because we have too many enemies. We have England and we have France and they can, can come and corrupt people, etc. We cannot put the power in the hands of the people because then we will not have an American Union. We cannot trust the people. Then you created a republic and then in time that republic was called a, re a democracy and not only a democracy but a model, universal model of democracy. But it is not a democracy. It is a system in which a group of people can control the whole operation of the society. Today, we are going beyond that discussion. We don't pretend that we are gods and we are trying to create uh, a different kind of process, a political process. Perhaps the most radical statement of the Zapatistas uh, is that they say, we, the Zapatistas, we are only common, ordinary men and women. That is, because we are no ordinary men and women, then we are non-conformists, rebels, and dreamers. And I, as I said uh, just one hour ago in another room, uh, this sounds great, but really it's not too romantic. Uh, every ordinary men and women, the common men, the common women, that fat woman coming out of Walmart with a lot of shit, a lot of groceries, is she a rebel, a non-conformist, said Dreamer? Yes, said the Zapatista. That woman, every man and woman, ordinary men and women, their rebellion can be latent, can be hidden, because there are many factors forcing them to hide that rebellion. But it is the very moment of revolution, the revolutionary spirit, it starts with ordinary men and women that are expressing that rebellion. Some people very seriously say that the French Revolution started the day in which one person refused to bow before the Lord and most importantly refused to accept that the king was king because of personal decision of God. You remember the Pope was coming every time of the crowning of a king and the Pope was saying to the people, you must respect this guy, he will be your king and you must obey him because that is the decision of God. God himself takes the decision that this guy should be your king. And the people believed that. And the revolution started the very day when one person said, no, God has nothing to do with it. We cannot believe that specific. That is a stupid idea. And then because they cease to believe that, they refuse to bow before the Lord. That is the beginning of the revolution. The problem is that we have here a very old problem. That um, the problem is that when the people can express themselves democratically without manipulation, uh, then most people will vote for things that good socialists will call petit bourgeois preferences. For example, they will vote for some pornography, uh, more sports, more TV than readings. What you can find in a popular journal uh, and is an image of what the people seem to want. The socialists, at least in Europe, solved this problem in a simple way. An elite should lead the people towards a better understanding of the problem. This looked satisfactory and, and was appropriate for very simple things. But in all the rest, the elite becomes corrupt. And the only way to stop such corruption is to stop being elite and to open the system to the people. But then the people bring to the regime of decisions uh, things that are 
ethically, aesthetically, and philosophically unacceptable. And how, how to escape from that cycle? One idea is to accept that people need to learn what to do after so many years of manipulation, and you need to teach them the process. But that is populism, and even the best populism. And populism also failed. Apparently, we are in a dead end. We don't know what to do. For 100 years, we were trapped in the ideological debate, capitalism or socialism. We stopped thinking, and we don't know what to do now. One pertinent answer was given in, uh, by the occupiers in Wall Street. The months, all the journalists, all the media, all the powers that be have been asking, which are your demands? And then they ask the demands, why to present demands? You present demands when you believe that they are going to solve them, to attend them, to satisfy them. Because we don't believe that they can satisfy them, then we are not presenting any demands. And then they will say, okay, okay, then which is your proposal? And the answer is also very simple. We don't have any proposal. But the question is that we know that they don't have a good proposal now. They, the powers that be, the government, the leaders, the uh, intellectuals, they don't have a proposal. What we need now is to have a democratic discussion to reach democratic consensus about what to do. Um, this is one uh, of the answers. We are clearly at the crossroads. We are at the end of an era. The world is falling apart before our eyes. We need a change. But people don't jump blindly, blindly into the unknown, into uncharted territory. Unless they have hope, what we need is to nourish their hope. Hope is the very essence of popular movements. And we cannot take for granted that everybody see with us the nakedness of the emperor. Many people see, uh, see it still clothed with all the clothes constructed by the politicians, the intellectuals, and the media. We have been lacking both imagination and practical examples of alternative paths. In 1996, at the end of the intercontinental encounter, the Zapatistas told us, told us something that was very impressive that moment. They said you had 6,000 people, activists from 70 countries, really great uh, leaders in their own places, uh, real uh, magnificent activists, and then the Zapatistas told all of us, we are not here to change the world, something that is very difficult and perhaps impossible. We are here to create a whole new world. Oh, great, applause. <laughs> but after a few minutes or a few hours, we said, oh, beautiful, yes, that's beautiful, but that is very romantic, that is not practical. Uh, how you will create a whole new world. After months, and for some of us, after years of meditation and practice, we discovered that they were right. To change the world is next to impossible. Uh, let's imagine the education. We know that education is failing. It's not delivering. It's not uh, uh, delivering. Uh, it's not preparing people for life and work. Try to change the educational system in one country in the world. And you will spend your whole life trying to change the system, and you will end your life as a footnote in a textbook. You, you cannot change the system. You cannot change the system in one small university. It is next to impossible. But if you think, oh, the whole question is how we can learn, that is the challenge. What we need is to learn, and to learn what we want to learn. You can do that tomorrow morning. You, you don't need to wait. You need to change the system. You can create a whole new world, a whole new possibility tomorrow morning. We have been unable to imagine the alternatives. We were so concentrated in the critique of what is wrong in the world, um, the world we don't want at this falling, that we were unable to imagine, live, and share with others the new world beyond it. But not all of us, common people, Ordinary men and women all over the world, sometimes a struggle for sheer survival, some other times in the name of all ideals. Ordinary people are taking the initiative. Let's see some examples. Also, one hour ago, I was uh, using the example of something very important for all of us, 
eating. We cannot survive without eating. And uh, the great Uruguayan poet, uh, Eduardo Galeano, said in a magnificent poem, uh, Global Fear, uh, he said, some of us are afraid of hunger. And how, how not? One, one billion people are going to bed tonight with, the stomach, with an empty stomach. Some people are afraid of hunger. But the rest of us are afraid of eating. Because all of us here, we know what is in our plates. We know that all of us in this room have poison in our bodies because of what they have been giving to us. And you cannot avoid that poison. You can go to any place and you will be severed poison. We know that. And then we are afraid of, of eating. Then what to do with that specific problem? That is a universal problem today. You are afraid of hunger or you are afraid of eating. To struggle to stop Monsanto al Walmart, al Walmart. To beg to, you ask President Obama to do something about agribusiness and he tried and he failed. He could not do anything. Then what to do? There are no solid proposals by intellectuals from the academic world, from the politicians, in how to solve that fundamental problem of how we can eat healthy food, good food, for our purposes. And people, ordinary people, are finding the solution. As I mentioned a few, uh, an hour ago, uh, the biggest organization in the history of mankind, Via Campesina, it is an organization of 800 million people today, of 140 countries, and a very solid organization, very well organized. And this magnificent organization, this organization reached a very solid consensus with a new definition of what is food sovereignty, pure peasant wisdom. Food sovereignty is to define by ourselves what to eat first, second, to produce it by ourselves. Is it say difficult to do? But they are doing this. And they, meaning not only Via Campesina, Via Campesina is advancing a lot in defining what to eat and producing it in proper in appropriate conditions, escaping from the chemicals, escaping from the Green Revolution, escaping from the conditions imposed by agribusiness. But it is also ordinary men and women all over the planet trying to produce their own food not only in the countryside, but also in the cities. And this is, uh, I, I, I cannot but use the, the word revolution for this revolution, producing food in the cities. It's a modern revolution, it's a contemporary revolution, using precedent. A hundred years ago, Paris was exporting food. It was possible to produce food in big cities. And now the people are reclaiming that tradition and they are producing a lot of food in the city. And you have that example, this is a well-known example, uh, to very magnificent new techniques like urbanoponics. Uh, the people in Habana are producing more than half of the food they eat in Habana. And they, you are producing magnificent conditions in many, many cities and it is also epidemic in the United States. In which you have not only this extension, this multiplication, this proliferation of examples in which the people are producing food in the cities, sometimes with amazing results and ingenuity. This guy in Pasadena, California, that produced in 362 square meters, three tons of 400 different vegetables in the city, in Pasadena, California. Uh, this is happening everywhere. This is happening, I, I, I don't know if this is true, uh, but I heard a friend of mine told me that there is a new regulation in New York. That Mr. Bloomberg imposed the regulation, the, the regulation that the, <coughs> the roosters cannot uh, crowd before 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, and the problem was that they are growing chicken in New York. Manhattan. If they are growing chicken, they are, they are having roosters. And if they're having roosters, they roosters uh, wake up early in the morning. And then many neighbors were saying, we are used to the cars, but not to the sound of the cars, but not to the sound of the roosters. And then they established this regulation, they put roosters out, put in a cage, and then they take uh, the cover of the cage at 8 o'clock in the morning for them to discover the, the, the sun. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but it is just an image, uh, a, a peculiar image of what is happening. Because you are having this growing food uh, 
instead of the uh, lungs that consumed most of the pesticides in this country for the lungs, instead of the lungs you are now growing tomatoes and chilies in, in, in front of your house or in the backyard and you are also having CSA, community support agriculture, new arrangements between consumers and uh, farmers. Uh, what is this? What happens if more and more people produce their own food? It's not only that when you grow your first tomato, you have a different mind, a different heart, a different connection with nature, a different connection with the environment. It is also that you are creating a new kind of social relations. You are creating, undermining the very basis of the current system. Um, we have been using, of course, the example um, Madhu Prakash brought to our attention the very important example of sheep. And yes, of course, we are having a revolution about sheep. Perhaps you know that uh, one Mr. Crapper uh, invented the signet for Queen Victoria, um, the, what we now know as the flush toilet, the water closet. Uh, and that is a technology that keeps the very fundamental element of the, the monarchic design that is in the origin. Uh, what we know now, many environmentalists are saying when, that, yeah, when you mix these three marvelous substances, urine, sheet, and water, you produce a very poisonous cocktail that uh, creates a very serious environmental problem. You contaminate everything, and you are using 40% of the water available uh, for domestic purposes, for the transportation of, of sheet, and that uh, um, that kind of substance uh, transported, uh, it's contaminated the soil, the air, it's a problem of public health, it is, it is terrible, it is really a very, very serious problem, that technology. And then, of course, there is alternative, there is a lot of alternatives. Uh, basically, what you can do is to have a composting toilet. And what is very difficult for me to share with you is what is the feeling of political liberation that you get when you disconnect your stomach from any centralized bureaucracy. If you have a flush toilet, you are absolutely dependent of someone at the center taking the sheet out of, your, uh, out of your house. And you can imagine what happens is that bureaucracy is paralyzed if there is a strike or something, and they cannot take the sheet out of your house. Your house becomes full of sheet. That, that is a pretty <laughs> serious problem. Then, but what it means to have this specific condition in which you have, with absolute autonomy, it's not only the principle, what is here in the mind, I'm taking care of my own shit, but it is also the principle, it is, I am transforming this problem of the shit in something very good for the soil, because I'm producing a magnificent compost, a very good compost for every, every possible purpose. And then we are using this as an expression of the kind of technology that can be the symbol, the metaphor, for the kind of change that we are trying to implement. We are saying, 200 years ago, the separation of church and state was the precondition for democratic societies. You know, the Pope came to the king, etc. For the possibility of democracy, it was needed to separate the church and the state, two different institutions. Today, we are saying, that what, need, what we need for emancipation is a separation of shit and state. <laughs> what is this? What is, what is the idea? <coughs> we need to have a kind of technology, technologies, practical technologies, uh, social technologies, political technologies that don't create a centralized system. That it sits, instead of needing, absolutely needing someone at the center we need a kind of technologies, social, political, physical, <coughs> material technologies that create the decentralized <coughs> organization of our society. We can use other examples. We can uh, think in uh, the question of education. We know that education is not delivering. Uh, we know that uh, basically the main product of education today is producing dropouts and disqualifying the majority of the people is perhaps the most oppressive of the class divisions of the modern society. Because through education, you create two classes, the educated and the uneducated or undereducated. You create a society in which you have some knowledge capitalists and destituted. 60% of the children 
now entering into the first grade, according with UNESCO, will never reach the level that in their countries is considered obligatory. And you, if you don't reach that minimum level of education, in the US is 10 years, in Mexico is nine years, if you don't reach that level, you, are happy, you will be discriminated against your whole life. You are disqualified because you could not reach that. And that is, education is created this terrible separation, this terrible discrimination for the majority of people on earth. People know this. People have been suffering this discrimination, the majority of people on earth. Many people were knocking in the doors. We want more schools, we want more teachers, we want more education, more funds, more public funds for uh, the students, uh, more money for education. No society has ever been able to satisfy this specific demand. Demand to give, you, you know the story, no child left behind. You know what happens, most people are left behind. That is the reality. Even the richest countries on earth cannot satisfy that demand. The people are no longer waiting for this. There are some still knocking the doors, but many of them are saying the idea is to learn. Even the poorest societies on earth can learn if they organize by themselves, can learn whatever they want to learn uh, without the system, going beyond the system. We can talk about one and the other, one, every one of the areas of, uh, of um, our society to see what is, how, what is what the people are uh, doing to express themselves and to create a whole new world. In every sphere of the daily life, we can now find examples of the profound transformation taking place. Um, if one expression can capture its, 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 capture in its many faces, is the expression coming from South America, from the indigenous people, that is buen vivir, living well. There are many different ways of living well, and this is what they are not trying to do, not dreaming about, but implementing in the real world. Um, one way of expressing this is the recovery of verbs that illustrate the movement for living well. If we talk about education, we immediately think in a dependence of the educators. Someone is to educate us. Someone will provide us with other specific commodity called education, private or public institutions. If instead of the noun education, we use the verb learning, we have the agency, we are the ones learning, we can create the conditions for us to learn whatever we want to learn. And we can say the same instead of health, you have after the most important, the most profound reform of the health system, you have in America, the worst, the most expensive and inefficient health system in the, in the planet. People are not waiting. If we th instead of thinking in health, you think in healing, you have the agency again, and millions of people are waiting, are looking for alternative ways. Instead uh, of uh, the social relations defining capitalism, we are now having the kind of relations defining the commons, and we have even a name for that specific movement, communism instead of communism. It is the reclaiming the commons, reclaiming the old movement for the commons. And for this specific movement, what we have is basically three pillars. We can talk more later. It is the three fundamental pillars for the creation, reorganization of this society. This doesn't look very academic. It is the basic pillars that the people themselves are creating. It's friendship, hope. A surprise. These are three pillars that are reorganizing the society from the bottom, from the bottom up. We are clearly going beyond development and globalization. That dream, suggested by President Truman in 1949, uh, became a nightmare, and today is over. It is now acknowledged, and then we have many, many different ways to qualify, to disqualify all development uh, programs, or development policies, and to see how we are going beyond development and beyond uh, globalization. But now let me talk about something else. The title of this talk, invented by Mahandra, uh, <laughs> included 
the word anarchy. That combines the approach of when we be living well, um, going beyond development and globalization with anarchy. What is this cocktail? I can call to help me in this predicament, our beloved Howard Sin. Anarchy, said Sin, distorts most Western people because it is associated with disorder, chaos, violence. We are afraid of those conditions because we have been living in them for a long time, but we have not been living in anarchist societies which have never existed, but in the powerful nation states which are so afraid of anarchism. There is no other moment in history, said since, with more social chaos. And it is precisely this kind of conditions that the anarchists attempt to eliminate. They want to bring some kind of order to the world for the first time. Paul Goodman came to visit Illich in Cuernavaca many years ago. Paul Goodman, the great American anarchist. And he was presenting his ideas, in which he was presenting basically his argument about law and order. And then an American student interrupted him and said, how do you dare to, to say this? You, you came to listen to the great anarchist, and you are talking about law and order? And the immediate reaction of uh, Paul Goodman was to start to cry. Uh, and then after he composed himself, he, he said, you know, only a good anarchist can really understand the meaning of law and order. Of course, we don't, wa we don't want their law and their order. It is not our law and order. It's not our way of life. It is not our principles of, uh, of for living together. But uh, one fundamental element of the anarchies, of anarchies is to look for law and for order. Uh, the common prejudice about anarchy, anarchism, is very old. The struggle for freedom the resistance to all forms of superior power is as old as the hills. But the mental association between anarchy and chaos, confusion and disorder, was pretty common before any anarchists existed. In the 18th century, that was the common perception. A place with no government, a place where the people had no respect for the authority, was not only the very definition of chaos and disorder, but barbaric. In 1790, writing about Turkey, Burke wrote about its barbarous anarchic despotism. They expect that they uh, shall hold in obedience an, ar an anarchic people by an anarchic army. In the 19th century, we added to this general pre prejudice the links between anarchism and violence, for good reasons. Very famous anarchists that like Nechayev were predicated, were all the time saying, he wrote something like the revolutionary catechism, and he was saying, we need to organize ourselves for destruction and use all kinds of violence against everyone. And then you have this kind of confusion with these anarchists that were very violent and using terrorism, and you have <coughs> not only them, but you have also the pseudo-anarchism of, cap uh, of uh, uh, capitalism, and you have the individualistic anarchists of Stirner. You, you can have a total confusion about what is anarchy. And I, 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 uh, we, I don't want to engage in a th theoretical discussion about what is anarchism or what is the definition or the, the really the impossible attempt, attempt to define it or to subsume in one single category all forms and schools of anarchism. But if we think in contemporary terms and we associate anarchism with a struggle for freedom and self-government, that is people that pretend to govern themselves in freedom, rejecting external imposition of higher powers. I can say in a provocative way that it is embedded in the original American dream. The images presented in many Westerns that we all have seen. What is what you see in these Westerns, in these small villages in a Western? It is people organized to create their own law, their own system of order by themselves, independently, autonomously, a real men and women trying to govern themselves. This is clearly embedded in the American dream. 
uh, what uh, I see in this country today is a very radical process. It is not only the radical situation and that collective awareness that we are experiencing everywhere. It's a peculiar process to reclaim that original American dream, transmogrified into a nightmare by the progressive corruption of your ideals. As Ivan Illich once said, corruptio optima qua est pessima, the corruption of the best is the worst. This happened here. Tom Paine or Thoreau were not anarchists or Marxists. They were American, very American. In the invention of this country, there were very clear reservations <coughs> about the central government and a courageous decision to keep the power in the hands of the people, to have a real democracy, not a representative republic, as Hamilton and Madison discussed. Right now, we can see a lot of confusion. Three weeks ago, after accepting his defeat in Maine to Romney for a close margin, Ron Paul told his followers, remember, the revolution is just beginning. We can assume that the revolution he's talking about is not the same described by Marx when he examined the Paris Commune and celebrated, uh, and celebrated the dismantling of all the state apparatuses. Anyway, we need to be aware that this is also a moment of danger. On the one hand, in a radical situation, when the people is not fully awake, all kind of demagogues may occupy the dreams. Competent politicians may capture their impulse and bring them back to the old way. On the other hand, may dominate the picture at any moment, as we are seeing, and nobody knows the outcome of a violent confrontation. But what I am experiencing at the grassroots, what I am smelling every day, is an ocean of hope, friendship, and surprise. And I cannot imagine a better way to conclude this talk than to quote again our beloved Howard Sin. The anarchists, he wrote, see revolutionary change as something immediate. It is something that we need to do today, right now, wherever we are, where we live, where we work or study. It implies to begin right now to get rid of all the authoritarian and cruel relations between men and women, parents and children, between different kinds of workers. This is not an armed uprising. It happens in the little corners which cannot be reached by the powerful but clumsy hands of the state. It is not centralized or isolated. It cannot be destroyed by the powerful, the rich, the police. It happens in a million places at the same time, in the families, in the streets, in the neighborhoods, in the workplaces. Suppressed in one place, it reappears in another until it is everywhere. Such revolution is an art. That is, it requires the courage, not only of resistance, but of imagination. And yes, that is the idea. Thank you. Perhaps I can jo join this question with another. Is there another question? Or should I answer this one? Okay. Yes, please. Um, my question is going to be how your own political views change, or first when you came, where you came from when you were young, and um, how you come to where you are now. And so I guess if you join that with the question about that. Uh, 
Um, perhaps I can, I can in fact, uh, join the tweets. I, I cannot uh, present in just a few words 75 years of, of life, uh, but I can synthesize it in, with some elements. Um, uh, my supper, the grandmother, could not enter into my house in Mexico City through the front door because she was an Indian. Um, my mother, like many other people of her generation, assumed that the best thing that he, she could do for her children was to radically uproot us from any connection for our indigenous ancestry. And, uh, and then um, I was um, educated, I was raised as a Westerner, adoring my grandmother, but with this basic education of Western, then I was fully individualized. I was one individual in suburbia. Um, I tried almost everything. Yes, I tried because I had a specific opportunity, a glorious opportunity. I was uh, the youngest exec uh, executive ever for IBM. I was personal manager of Procter & Gamble before I was 20 years old. Uh, but both companies fired me because I could not accept doing what they asked me to do. Then uh, I discovered that I could not have a decent life in the private corporations in spite of the success. And then the pendulum of development brought me to the other extreme. And then I became first a leftist, then a Marxist, then a guerrilla guy. Please remember, it's the time of Che Guevara. It is the glory of the Cuban Revolution. In that time, we were thinking in Latin America that we had the obligations to become guerrilleros. That, that was the, the idea. And then, because we have a terrible episode in which uh, one of our leaders killed the other leader because of a woman, and then that was the revelation for us. That was the kind of violence we were imposing to ourselves, and we wanted to impose to the whole of the society. And then, I did not abandon the ideas of development and revolution, but uh, not uh, violence. Violence was not, no longer acceptable. Then I joined the government and I tried the government. Okay, the guerrilla was to seize the government. Then let's try the government peacefully inside the government. And suddenly I got an incredible amount of power uh, with the populist president in Mexico. Uh, I mobilized millions of people with all this power uh, with such success that I was in the immediate danger of becoming a minister in the next administration. Then I quit because by that time I knew that the logic of the government and the logic of the people never coincide. Then I started to uh, work and live at the, grass, at the grassroots. Um, it was beautiful, beautiful, but very puzzling. I could not understand what I was experiencing every day. I could not see what was happening. And then I assumed, oh, it is because I am, uh, I, I am not enlightened or not. I need, I, I need to, to know more. I need to study more economics, more sociology, more anthropology, more political science. And the more I studied, the less I understood. And then one day I took off my lenses and I, I could no longer use the lenses, the categories, the formal categories in which I was educated. And I tried to see with my own eyes. And I started to discover a whole new world of possibilities. But still as an individual, still as that individual in which I was raised. Uh, yes, two things happened for my benefit, for my, uh, my enlightenment. Uh, that was first I started to remember. When I was a child, I asked to be sent in holidays with my grandmother uh, that tended a stall in the main market of Oaxaca. And then I started to remember uh, the lessons that I learned with her. Uh, my grandmother was in the back of my mind, <laughs> not in the front where I had development and all the categories and Marxism and all these things. But suddenly I started to remember and remembering her remembered me with my people at the grassroots but still as an individual. And then I met Ivan Illich uh, by accident in, in 1983, uh, and I discovered that this course of this guy, Ivan Illich, was really fantastic in the way he articulated the ideas and the needs and the uh, perceptions of, of the people. And then with Ivan Illich, with the memories of my grandmother, uh, going to live in this small Zapotec village uh, in um, in the south of Mexico, I discovered something that is pretty special. I cannot be one of them. I dismantled step by step with a lot of problems my Western um, self. I'm no longer a Westerner. That I can tell you, I can explain to you, I can use hours to, to, to show to you how I dismantled all the fundamental pillars 
of the Western culture. They know intimately the Zapotec culture, and I'm not a Zapotec. I can pose as a Zapotec. I can speak some Zapotec words. I can live in a Zapotec village. I have my milpa and my adobe house, and I, I can pose as a Zapotec. I can't pretend that I am Zapotec, but precisely because I know very well who are the Zapotec. I, I know that I'm not a Zapotec. I, I don't know who the hell I am. <laughs> but I can tell you something. The way we are reconstructing the world, the way we are learning with them, with indigenous people, with these kind of organizations, they cannot be an individual I. They are always a we. There are some of them, like the Tojolabales in, in Chiapas, they don't have a word for I or you. They have only different kinds of we. If you and me are talking, there is one we. If we include her, three people, that is a different kind of we. Inclu we include all the people in this room, that is a different kind of we. If we include all the, the Holabalis, that is a different kind of we. They cannot, every eye is a we in that kind of, of people. They are we. The we is the first layer of your being. But not, uh, that's not our case, actually. The first layer is a different kind of layer. And we know how it was constructed. I don't know if you remember uh, the story of this doctor, Benjamin Spock, uh, the one that produced a very famous book, Your Son, particularly for uh, new families, the baby boom. They, don't know, they didn't know how to raise children. It has a magnificent index to discover what is exactly happening with your baby. In the first five editions of Dr. Spock, there was the catechism for the young couples. First commandment, your baby should never be in the parent's bed. That is forbidden territory. Second commandment, your child should be in his, her own room as soon as possible. If possible, the very day you come back from the hospital. Third, it is very good for your child to cry alone at least half an hour a day. For his physical and mental development, it is great. And you can see, I have seen the scene. The mother, oh God, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and he's crying. I don't know what is happening. That's torture. That's horrible. Torture for the baby and torture for the mother. But what is what you are creating that way? You are growing, raising an individual. You are producing an individual. And you can immediately see the difference. What is the difference when you go to India, to Mexico, and you saw that magnificent tool of the child, you have the baby next to the body of the mother for many months and perhaps for years. That baby is growing, is being raised as a we, not as an I. Wait, I'm answering the question. <laughs> Our only hope is friendship. Our only hope. We can create new commons, new possibilities of community, we don't have anything that we can call a community. We those individualize it. We Dr. Spock or without Dr. Spock. Those that have been raised in these individual conditions. We are as individuals separated from the others. Then our only hope is friendship. We all have a thousand friends, but real friends, real, real friends, true friends. We have two, three, four, and five if we are very rich. Well, with this limited number of friends, with a few friends, we can create a new kind of commonality. With this fundamental principle of friendship, the gratuity, that something that you do for your friend uh, without expectation of reciprocity, just because he or she is your friend. And, and you do that, and you give to him or her uh, with a gratis because it is your friend. Well, with that kind of spirit, with that kind of connection, two, three friends, and you can create a new commons for one thing. And then another day, with other friends, you can create another commons for two, three friends. And every one of them has have two or three friends also. And then you are creating small groups of the new commons. And these new urban commons in the cities, you don't need, I hope you will go to a farm. But if you are not going to a farm, then in the city, you can create a proliferation of new commons. This is what we are calling commonism. Yes. There are people that have their own, their own commons, and they are regenerating them. 
There are people that are succeeding in reclaiming their commons. We are not listening to this. This is a very silent revolution. I was telling Mahanda about Peru, where the Quechuas and the Aymaras occupied in the last 10 years one million hectares. One million hectares is an enormous amount of, of, uh, of land. And they are producing 40% of the food in Peru, silently, step by step, hectare by hectare. People are occupying every kind of spaces in the cities and in the countryside silently. And they can also occupy the spirits. That is the most important point. Yes, it's very important. One of the most beautiful phrases I heard in Wall Street is, occupy your food supply. It's great. That's exactly the idea. Yes, occupy your food supply. That is great. You are not occupying physically. It's not the Sukkoti Park. It is not uh, the Liberty Plaza. It is occupying how you are eating, how you can occupy the way you are eating. Yes, that is very, very important. But all this is possible through the new commons, to this communism, creating new commons through friendship. And we are mixing, I mentioned it, friendship, hope, and surprise. Yes, hope is the very essence of popular movement. People are mobilized because they have hope. If I do this, things will change. Yes, that hope is, is basic. But hope, we need to remember, is not the arrogance of pretending that we know the future and we will determine what will happen. Hope is not the conviction that something will happen, but the conviction that something makes sense, whatever happened. And that is what is happening. People have this new hope. This makes sense. This is what we need to do. Uh, you can have them in Wall Street, of in Athens, or in Plaza del Sol, in, in, um, in Madrid, where they are saying, my dreams don't fit in your ballot box. We can no longer believe in the ballot box. We can no longer believe that the elections, a new party, a new leader. My God, you cannot imagine a better candidate than Obama. He's enlightened, well-prepared, well-trained, social commitment, political committing, commitment, he's black, he's even guapo. And then <laughs> you have the best possible president. And then everybody's frustrated because he cannot do the things. But he told you, as a candidate, he told you, the main slogans of President Obama, candidate Obama, I'm not asking you to believe in me, but to believe in you. Once in the White House, he said, I will not be able to fix anything, but you can. But apparently, in November the 5th, in that year, people said, oh, great, we elected a great president. Let's wait, and he will fix everything. Of course, he cannot fix anything. No one can fix anything upstairs, but the people can. This is what we are seeing today. Not waiting for the next election, not waiting for the uh, next candidate, but saying what is what we can do. And we, not I. How every one of us can join a common. And when I'm sorry, yes, friendship, hope, and surprise. Because we don't have a plan, and we don't need a plan, and we don't want a plan. Foucault stated this very clear. He explained how to think in the whole of the society it is stupid, irrelevant. You cannot think in the whole of the society. The whole of the society is the outcome of many a thousand different kinds of initiatives. Um, just a brief story. 1988, Mexico City, 15 million people in this monstrous settlement. Uh, we had a gigantic fraud, electoral fraud, uh, but not in Mexico City because we had a city on, in our hands. And then we have that spirit. It just, they, they put a president up there, but we have the city. We, have, we are in control of the city. We have a big, very fantastic movement, very well-organized movement. We, can put, we could put uh, 7 million people in the street from one day to the next. And then we started to have something like an alternative parliament. And then we started to discuss thousands and thousands of people discussing everything. And then one of the leaders of one barrio the first day came and said, we have been very responsible because we have been concentrated in our small barrio, in our neighborhood. But after all, we live in a city. Now that we have the city in our hands, let's think what to do with the city. After three months of very democratic discussion, we came to one conclusion. 
the city does not exist. And only a mad pathological mind can think the stupid idea of governing democratically this city of 15 million people. We are very different. We have different ideas. We have different projects, different ideologies. We are advancing in different directions. How to pretend that someone can govern all of us with one system, whatever kind of system? And then a group of uh, friends came and uh, told us, you are stupid. Of course, we need the city exist. And of course, we need centralized planning for many things, for example, for the traffic, for, uh, to organize all the traffic, the transportation in the city. But we have other group of friends that came and say, no, all the problems of traffic, all the traffic jams in the big cities on Earth have been created by those planners of the traffic. That they are the source of the problem, not the solution. The only way, this is the experience all over the world, the only way to solve the problem of traffic in any big city is to have separate organization of the traffic in every neighborhood, and then you connect all of them. And that is the solution. I, I, I can continue that beautiful story, but it is just a story to say we don't need to think in the whole of the society. We don't need to take for real after entities like a big city or a big country. We need to think at the, at the scale of the human. We are just humans not gods. We need to uh, create whole new worlds, our little worlds, the world in which we can think and act. Uh, Wendell Berry says very clearly, uh, global thinking is impossible. And again, Wendell Berry is perhaps not only uh, one of the greatest poets alive, but uh, perhaps one of the greatest philosophers alive. And he's very very, very American. Well, not, not American. He's Kentuckian, not, not American. He, he belongs to Kentucky, and in Kentucky he thinks. And he's exploring very profoundly the American traditions and finding in the American traditions a different kind of connections between the people and with nature. Uh, what apparently is happening here in this area of the world is that many people, millions, these great poets and philosophers, and uh, also many people, ordinary men and women, and of course the occupiers and many other people uh, are <coughs> basically reclaiming uh, an original dream that became a nightmare. Uh, they are reclaiming their possibility of living in freedom at the human scale, creating many we's instead of the individualistic eyes. You can experience, you can see today in this country the pain of individualism. Yes, this it was created here, it was advanced here, it was created in a hyper individualism. And other people say, What is this? What poverty is to live like competitive individuals? Uh, that there is a kind of longing for something else, for this commons, for this community, for this alternative possibility. I'm talking too much. There is any other question? Please. So I think the, the society that you're sketching sounds very, very um, desirable, I guess, but it's also the, this rejection, idea of the rejection of the state um, reminds me a lot of, of uh, the very liberal strand of capitalism. And then if I think about, okay, what's the, which is not too far from our current society, then if I imagine the private sector to run run, run a country, that wouldn't would, would then look very different, I think, to, to the society you're sketching. So it seems like you need a, ver um, a very drastic and broad uh, change of mentality that precedes or accompanies that, that uh, rejection of the state. And um, that seems to me right now unrealistic, I would say. And uh, it, it seems, um, I, I'm wondering, so do you think it is realistic and how, how would, would you have very small regional units that sort of look like a state? So uh, I'm guessing you're saying they, they, they govern themselves. And so is it still, um, uh, some people still make decisions? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure how, uh, so it sort of seems to go back to, to the pre-nation uh, environment, which also had wars and which uh, uh, had its own problems. Um, and first of all, seeing that, uh, or I think many people probably consider it very unrealistic. And given that, don't you think that it's maybe better to 
change the world rather than create a new world uh, if you want to do anything at all. And, um, if you, uh, well, and then going back, if you try to create a world with these small units, if, that's, if I'm supposing that, that uh, that's true, what, what I'm guessing you're trying to do, um, wouldn't that still have these problems? It's a fantastic question. Th thanks a lot. It's really beautiful. And, and you presented very, a collection, a very good collection of solid arguments. Uh, let's start by the end. Um, see all the plans for reform to change the world, to change this world. And they look absolutely idealistic, romantic, and impractical. Mention one. Uh, that change the electoral system of the United States. Impossible. They have been trying for years and years and years, and you cannot change it. And then uh, let's change the parties. How you will change the parties? Uh, let's change the system of government. No way. And to change that, that world seems pretty idealistic, romantic, and not feasible in the, real, in the real world. In a sense, what we are saying is that we have tried all the time, for years, every possible kind of reform, and we have failed. And then we are trying something else after that finish. Now, what you are saying is very, is clearly, clearly, absolutely uh, right. But part of the story is pure hypocrisy. Uh, you can say that President Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher argued all the time against the state. They were champions of the, the libertarians against the state. Uh, one of the officers of President Bush said, I am not against the state. The question is I am trying to reduce the size of the state to the, to the, to the proper size so I can flush it. Flush it. Then it will vanish. Like a piece of shit. <laughs> Pure your hypocrisy. Because in the time of President Reagan, or in times of Mrs. Thatcher, or in times of President Bush, the state grew more than ever. In terms of size, effective size, and grew in, in, in terms of uh, spend, uh, of, of budget, etc., etc. What they did was to reduce the functions of the state that were basically for regulation of the corporations, for regulations of capital to facilitate the transformation of the state in the administration of capital, of private capital. That, that was the process in the name of reducing the state because they knew, and these the Republicans know very well, that the people like this idea of reducing the size of the state. They preaching that, but not doing that. That is something different. About private uh, properties, private corporations, and the market. This is, again, this is something in the public debate. The market cannot exist or operate without the state. All the markets, all the free markets, have been created by the state and cannot operate one single day, day without the state. All these uh, pseudo-anarchism uh, for capitalists is pure uh, propaganda, demagoguery. Uh, you, you cannot imagine, you cannot conceive in the reality, in the real world, a market, a free market, without the regulations, the control, and the support of the state. You cannot imagine uh, the operation of these modern corporations without the operation of the state. Then that is part of the story. It's pure hypocrisy. They are talking about no state, but implemented everything through, through the state. This is from the beginning of capitalism. But you said something very interesting. This going back to the free nation state. Yes, there were a thousand different forms of state, a thousand different forms of nation before the nation state created by capitalism uh, for the purpose, purpose of administering capitalism. But now, the important point, the interesting point, is that that nation state created by capitalism and for capitalism is now an obstacle for capitalism. And now the nation state, that specific political regime is being destroyed. Some people think that it is in total agony. The main function of the nation state has been the administration of the national economy. You don't have one single national economy anymore. You cannot take decisions in the United States about the national economy of the United States because it's not the national economy anymore. When President Obama says, oh, we need to buy um, American steel to protect our economy, but only 70% of the steel belongs to the Americans. 
it is no longer, it's, it's, you, you, you need $2 billion a day of new capital to keep your economy going. New capital coming from abroad. Then the US economy, the biggest economy on earth, is completely transnationalized. Then the main function of the state, that was the administration of the national economy, is no longer there. Then the nation state is now exposed to a two-pronged attack from transnational corporations, from international institutions, from all the kind of forces at the level of beyond the nations, and internal forces in every country that are uh, undermining the possibilities of the state. And the nation state is no longer functioning in the reality, in the real world. I I'm not talking about illusions. I'm not talking about what is happening today in the real world. The, what we are seeing is that the nation state are no longer functional, are no longer operational. Uh, no one is in control. This is one of the most dangerous moments in which we are not uh, with someone in charge of the ship. We are in the perfect storm and no one in charge. One way of uh, describing this it is in the midst of the, this perfect storm, all the intellectuals, all the powers that be, all the governments, etc., I in the, in the machine room discussing what to do. And because they are discussing what to do, they don't see that the ship is sinking. But the people that is in the top, they are seeing that the ship is sinking. And some of them are fighting between them to have an individual solution for the problem, and they cannot find anyone. But the small groups, the small commons, are jumping out of the ship and start to navigate uh, in small pieces of wood or whatever, and they discover the archipelago of conviviality. This has been presented by Subcomandante Marcos and by other uh, enlightened indigenous people to describe what is happening today in the, in the world as a very practical solution in the midst of the, of the, perfect, of the perfect storm. There is something that um, produces uh, even irritation when I say these things. Some of these institutions may exist as a ritual for centuries, but not with reality. Technically, you have in England the Queen Elizabeth and a monarchy. But we all know that it is not a monarchy. It's a modern nation state. The monarchy is over, but you still have the Queen Elizabeth. Then in the nation states today, you still have the flag and the army and the rituals and the national holidays, and you have all these things that apparently the nation states are there, but they are not there. We, we, they are kind of zombies. They, they, they are no longer the, the real operational force that the nation state had in the past. Among other things, because of capitalism. The nation state that, that were the basic tool for the operation of capitalism are an obstacle today. They need something else. And, and, and it is not possible until now, apparently, to create that alternative. Please. Yeah, so I see how, how the current system has its problems, but uh, could you address the, the part that sort of what the counterfactual would, would uh, have as problems? So what the alternative society would look like? So I myself, for example, come from a commune in Germany that works very well on a scale of uh, 80 people, and uh, everybody knows themselves, and we have a perfect personal relationship. Um, and um, I, I can see that work with tribes or with uh, very uh, Zapatistas um, or, or that's still fairly small, but how would it work in a, in a world that has, uh, where, you, where you can move very quickly beyond the, 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 your own community, where you have information for, for parts beyond your own community? I feel like all these problems of um, the pre-nation, uh, uh, the, the, the wars of the pre-nation state um, would just be exacerbated by, by these new possibilities, right? It's, it's, um, please try to follow seriously your argument. With the nation states, you can have peace and order. No, I, Thinking I the heard. size of the nation state, if we stop thinking because in the tribes and these the Zapatistas and these small communities, you're 8,000 8, 8, or 80,000 people, uh, that will be problematic. But the scale of the nation state is not problematic. 
at the level of the nation state, we can have peace and order and happiness. And, and the experience is that it's impossible to have peace and order at that level. But at that level, you can have domination, control, repression, manipulation. That is the, the, the world experience. Uh, and, and you can see very well distinct models. Let's mention one of these models. Um, it's no longer there. It was a perfect model. The Switzerland, uh, the Swiss constitution, 1254. It was a beautiful constitution. What is what you had in Switzerland 800 years ago? You have people of three radically different cultures with very different la la languages. Uh, German, Italian, and French. It's not easy to, to, to speak among themselves. But it's not only three different cultures. You have the cantons that were small jurisdictions. In that time, people of 8,000, 10,000, 20,000 people in the cantons. That was the real strength of Switzerland. That was the canton, the size of the canton. It was a human scale. And you have the original uh, constitution. It was not a nation state. It was a confederation. It was the Helvetic Confederation. What was the political design? The political design is incredible respect for the canton real respect for the canton. The canton were people governing themselves. And the, a group of cantons, all the German cantons, have a common uh, activity, a kind of common light government. And a very light government at the level of the confederation. Now, this was in operation for 800 years until the banks uh, destroyed it. But, uh, but uh, it's not completely destroyed. It's what, uh, one of the most interesting democracies, the political regimes in the world today, even today. And that, that was the government at a small scale, created a possibility of peace in Switzerland. That is an example for many, many people for the last 800 years, in which Switzerland was able to remain out of all the conflicts of the powerful nation states around, around Switzerland. Um, let me uh, say something, combine this with another argument. Until the day before the collapse of the Soviet Union, no one anticipated the collapse of the Soviet Union. What you observed was all the analysts, all the experts, every kind of experts say, you have a very solid and trenchant organization there. It is impossible. You can have some movements here and there, but you cannot change that monster of the Soviet Union that was very solid. It's really, no expert was saying there is the possibility that one of these days the Soviet Union will collapse. Why it collapsed from one day to the next? What seemed impossible? Uh, what everybody, the common sense, uh, conventional wisdom was saying, you cannot change that. You can do some reforms. You can improve the operation of the Soviet Union. You have now an enlightened leader, Mr. Gorbachev, and you, you can have a negotiation with Mr. Gorbachev. And then you can have uh, what President Bush and Gorbachev wa were discussing. Let's have uh, a new world order, because this is a very enlightened guy. But you, you can make incremental marginal changes in the Soviet Union and poof, collapse. But what is the lesson we can derive from, from this kind of thing? the fragility, the incredible fragility of these very powerful institutions. And the incredible power, the resilience, the capacities of these very small organizations that are now thriving everywhere. Yes, with the Zapatistas in Chiapas. Yes, with many different parts. But I can start the enumeration of the examples in the United States or in Europe with a very intense enemy, the enemy of individualism, and the enemy of uh, the, the, the kind of veil we have before our eyes. Let me give you an example of, of uh, Germany. Germany is a beautiful example of a decentralized society. You have only one big city, but not very big, Berlin, for historical reasons. And you have a few cities of one million inhabitants, and half of the German population, it's a small towns of less than 10,000 uh, people. Yes, of course, you have the commuters. They are still working in the cities, but they are living in a small city. With one little problem, half of the Germans live in uh, houses 
where only one person lived at different ages. And that is an expression of terrible individualism. I was visiting friends of one of those beautiful cooperatives that you are mentioning. There are many of them in Germany today. I was visiting one. It's beautiful. Eight uh, families with lots of people, lots of children, uh, living together in one place, and 20 families around coming to work and participate in the activities. Uh, it was a big, vibrant uh, community of people working together and doing many things. And, oh God. Um, and um, then, because you know the draft, uh, four guys were providing social service in the, in the cooperative. And then after a few days there, when I was there, uh, they came to the cooperative and asked for permission to leave during the weekend to be at home. But they knew the cooperative, but at home they were alone, every one of them. They had four houses, and every one of them, the house was the house of one person only. And then they asked, OK, you can leave, of course, during the weekend, but why? Because there is too much intensity of human interaction.